So today I'm going to talk about how you can learn to smurf with honeypots. If anyone has not gotten the pun yet, smurf, I was referring to blue team. Um, and yes, I do explain puns, so, but I promise I'm fun in parties. So do talk to me later on as well. Um, so set a bit of expectation. Uh, who um, is this for? What's the, what's the presentation for? Um, is usually in conferences, you get to hear a lot about red team stuff and which, and blue team talks are generally very rare. And if you want, if you're not interested in blue team stuff, yes, this talks for you. Or you're interested to learn the way, the, the way of life of a smith or smith of a smurf, uh, the talks for you as well. Uh, other general target audience that, that this talk is really for is any one of you are just getting started in cybersecurity. Um, and you are still only thinking about raid teaming is the really fun stuff. Hopefully, I will widen your perspective in things you can do in blue team stuff. Um, yeah. So one big thing about this talk is also I'm not trying to split the camp between blue and raid. Um, and as we, you know, at the current day and age now as well, um, it's important that each, um, all the professionals are well equipped, understanding the red cam as well as the blue cam. So, and there's a new term for that. Anyone knows what do we call that team now? Purple? Yeah? You want to be one of these crazy purple people? Um, no. Um, actually, it's Papa Smurf, you know, blue at heart, wearing a red cap. Um, but, so this talk, uh, I'm not going to talk about both blue and red again. It's going to focus a lot on the blue side um, of things. Um, but of course, at this, in this, within these 30 minutes, you won't be an expert in it. Uh, but just, like I said, widen your perspective in, um, how honeypots can help for you being a better smurf. Right. So let's get the talk, uh, started. Anyone who do not know me, uh, I'm Emil. Um, I do lots of different things. I lead the HoneyNet project in Singapore that, you know, it's nothing glamorous. It's pretty much just my name is there and everyone else do the work. Um, other than that, I do many other stuff. Uh, I lead the community here called Edges and Dividend Zero with Money. Other great guys like Fat Lee who gave a talk yesterday as well, right in the audience, right in front here. Um, I also uh, co-lead and I co-founded a local, a Singapore local conference uh, called for Sign City. Anyone have not been there, do join us again next year. Uh, and we are great friends with HITV, so uh, we have a booth right out there to talk to us. Um, all this are pretty much my hobby. Uh, I'm doing them either um, for free or I actually lose quite a lot of money with them. Um, but I have to put food on my table. I actually work for a proper company. Not going to say where, um, but you'll figure out. Um, other than that, I also do uh, many other freelance advisory with startups like Cortex Insight and Maddox. Right, a little bit about my history, um, my domains. I started off in security in the research and development uh, area. So I do a lot of research, do a lot of developments of POCs, pro concept. Um, then uh, mainly on intrusion deception um, kind of topics. Um, follow that, I do. A, I was in the operation side of things, so really fighting, not fighting, uh, responding to um, to incidents. And then now, uh, from the more technical roles, I'm um, in a more uh, the most exciting uh, domains of all in security, which is to write papers in policy, governance, and all. So really, really sexy, exciting stuff, which all of you love so much. Um, so in security, it's always important to keep yourself a brace, keep yourself um, um, well trained. Uh, so on lots of things that you need to learn in policy. Uh, but as a policy maker, uh, I always believe that technical expertise is still important. Uh, so with that, I uh, always believe that you know you, you have to mature in both of these aspects uh, concurrently. You can't do you can't be a good policy maker if you don't understand technology. Um, and one of my main ways of doing that, other than playing with um, various different hardwares and stuff like that, is through honeypots, which I'm going to talk a lot about honeypots later uh, for this talk. So about honeypots, um, lots of people actually got introduced to honeypots uh, via these means, like usually you pick up a textbook uh, from bookstores, from if you are, from your universities, from your polytechnics, or through very interesting causes like CISPI. Um, and then those textbooks will start going through as typical process stuff like CIA, 
then talk about, oh yeah, it's not just a technology, it's PPT. Uh, and then follow up with many, many other mechanisms as well, telling you about encryptions, firewall, IDSs, um, antiviruses, so on and so forth. And if you are security practitioners or professionals as you deploy, so you start to follow the textbook, right? So deploy this, 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 this. And then the textbook usually will end off and say, oh, there's something called the honeypots. And honeypots is about um, attracting attackers to your honeypots, learn about them, and you counter them. And that usually sounds really sexy. But unfortunately, just like just one paragraph, and you kind of like, if you, you have done all these things, build a honeypot, you know, use honeypots. And then because of that, uh, usually what happens is people, after they go through, it, it start deploying and installing all the typical uh, security mechanisms. They decided that, oh yeah, we need to build a honeypot. I admit I was one of these guys before. Uh, after everything, I was like, yeah, I need to build a honeypot. So um, one of the topics I always like to talk about is why don't you need why don't you why you don't need a honeypot or why you don't need honeypots. Um, the last time the last few times I did this talk I took two hours to rent through the whole thing. I'm pretty much on stage renting for two hours. So I'm not gonna do that today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about something else entirely uh, on how on more towards the educational side of things. Um, so back to basic if any one of you have still not know, or you don't know what is honeypot, honeypot pretty much is not, um, usually when people talk about honeypots, it's always like, oh, you know, it's all this fancy stuff. It's all this about, you know, playing with the attackers and so on. But this is actually the most, uh, I think the most um, appropriate definition. Honeypots is pretty much, um, is any resources, no production values, and its purpose is just to be attacked. So that is a very um, generic term, right? So what it really means is hunting pots is anything that is up to your own imagination. Uh, and so that's the problem with what I have in most uh, in the industry is people come out and say, yeah, I need to deploy a honey pot. So it's like, yeah, what's that? Because it's really up, it can it really be anything, right? Um, but there are two main use cases that I really agree on. Uh, in honeypots being used in productions. One is for detections, like canneries, um, which are resources or information resources that you put on your network, which no production value is being probed, means something's wrong, right? The other interesting use cases that has been very popular is to use as decoys or through the art of deception, right? So with the knowledge that pretty much there's always attacker somewhere in your network, how can you trick them, how can you use deception to play around with them and um, move them away from a production network and so on and so forth. So it's a big art on deception and there are more and more uh, companies nowadays, more and more tools that 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 is uh, selling deceptions now. Um, but actually for me, uh, I what I really think, honey, the, the real value what I think about Honeypot is actually for training purpose, for education purpose. Um, because, again, honeypots can be anything, right? So um, you can really play with all kinds of different use cases. And I think it's a great educational and training tool because as you deploy honeypots, or you, as you try to build honey nets, you have to think about the architectural perspective. How do you want to build it? Where are you going to place certain things? What kind of mechanism is needed? And so on. And then, of course, honeypots will be collecting lots of data. Um, then that comes in handy when, you know, you have to start thinking about analytics. How are you going to really make use of them? Collecting is one thing, but if you don't use them, it's nothing. So it trains your ana analytical um, skill. Be it you capture malware, it helps, so you have to be good in malware analysis. Uh, if it's a network, very interesting stuff you can do in analytics for network packets and so on. Um, forensics, because Honeypots is meant to be attacked. You, as you investigate it, you are doing forensics investigation. Um, helps you in that. And again, you have lots of data, uh, lots of area in data science that you can really explore. Um, so it's really good educational tool again, uh, help you understand theoretical things that you learn from textbooks, from articles, from white papers, whatever not. Uh, it helps, uh, it really build your technical skills because as you deploy them 
at least it gives you a sense of purpose uh, that you know you are really coding some some things out or you are deploying a real resources somewhere in your network. Um, get your hands a bit dirty, and of course, operation skills because honeypots are generally very, very hard to maintain. So again, um, it's a great educational tool, uh, and it's always up to imagination, which I really love. Um, so generally, I always like to dream about different ways that you can use honeypots, um, because you know you you can really explore all kinds of fields, right? Uh, so in the HoneyNet project, um, I focus a lot on the research side of things. And for one of the main um, bit or big main bit of that is we actually collaborate with Polytechnics um, to get them to work on research. Um, so a bit of win-win for us. We get to see what kind of interesting stuff that can come out of it. The other thing is get get them uh, really delve deep into certain subjects um, because it's only through experience, um, through really get their hands dirty that can, they can truly understand certain domains, certain topics. I'll talk about some of them a bit later. So um, my, so these are some. This is a summary of uh, projects that I did with uh, Singapore Polytechnic the last couple of years. Uh, some are, 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 are actually very recent. Um, I actually split my projects into two parts. So some of the projects is mainly on the more theoretical side of things, like proof of concept, which is like there is a concept about certain domains like threat intelligence, that's like ops and things like that. So as students, as you know, as students, or if you read about, or even as professionals or practitioners, you read about some new techniques, you read about it, but there's no use cases that you really Get your hands dirty and and play around, right? So I generally married that with honeypots, like you know, because again, no production value and and so on. And you can really just like you know, use honeypots for all these purposes. Um, and yeah. So again, so generally the four um the the, the projects on. Theoretical things. So usually it ties on with concept, and some other is a bit more straightforward. Which is we realize that there are certain tools that are really cool to develop, and we just get them to develop it. Um, the IoT HoneyNet, the, the IoT project one was quite interesting because it's supposed to be a proof of concept one, but it became a tool development one. Uh, I'll tell you more about it uh, later. So the next, the, the the for the remaining of the presentation, what I'm gonna do is I will delve into some of these uh, projects, and pretty much give you a bit of crash course on some of the blue team concept. Um, that was that was being explored, and um, in in the course of of the research. Right. So the first one, super long title. So the idea was back then everyone is saying that they are doing threat intelligence. Lots and lots of company coming out and say, "Hey, buy our intelligence. It's good for you. You know, you you, you should not just be passively waiting for alerts to pop out of your face. You need to be proactive. Buy our feeds." So I got really annoyed, and I was hoping that we do not have lots of next generation students thinking about that. That you know, intelligence is about just about buying feed. So I engaged a couple of students. Like, right, let's just go delve deep into threat intelligence, get them really understand threat intelligence, um, and then how honeypots can help in this domain. So, cast the super long title, uh, and not just cyber threat intelligence, right? Um, so we spent, um, I got the students and we sat down and we spent a long time coming up with a definition of what is threat intelligence, right? So we came up with these definitions, uh, information that is contextualized, is relevant to you, um, to an organization group, your operational environment, and it allows proper understanding of the enemy, the advisories, and the risk, the potential risk that you may face, and most importantly, it enables you to act or make better decisions. So three main um, components when it comes to threat intelligence. If you don't have all these three, it's not intelligence, right? So why do why do we delve so long into getting this definition right? Because if you are not, if you do not have definition right, you will not, you not, you will not know whether you are deploying the right thing. You do not know uh, whether you are tackling. Um, a single subject correctly, right? So, policy guy, we love definition. 
and that's why we spend so much time doing so, right? Um, so, and, and then other bits of the projects, uh, we got to define that's the big, big contrast between threat information and threat intelligence, if you do not really know them. Um, so lots of people are always starting out, yeah, there's IOC out there, there's TTP, um, the attackers' tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, there are alerts, there are threat reports, all these are intelligence, no, they're not, they're actually threat informations. Right, um, because with all these four, it does not give you the three components that's needed. It will not tell you exactly what to act. It will not tell you how, what kind of decision to make, and it is not contextualized to you. There's actually a lot more process that is needed behind it, right? So, it, intelligence uh, is only considered intelligence when that you know you know what exactly to do with all this information. Right, not just take it, scan it, oh, I'm fine. There's no heat on my system. That's intelligence, not. Right, so some of the decision that, um, uh, the, 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 the consumer of threat information can do is they contextualize it, they understand it, they analyze it, and they can make decisions such as how they can, you know, discern the kill chain, how they can really further strengthen their defenses, or even improve the information, uh, the incident response, uh, procedures and so on, their capabilities. So with that, we actually came up with a big framework on before you do intelligence, or you want, you are, if you want to do uh, threat intelligence, um, we came up with a framework called life. It's pretty much meant for intelligence from honey. Um, when you get students to do projects, you always get interesting, funny names. Um, so first, um, you need to understand your objective. If you do not have an objective, your intelligence is not helping, right? Then you need to identify what kind of artifacts you really have. Uh, that is, or what kind of artifacts is needed for you to um, make the final decision at the end. And you have to identify some of the source of, 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 of data. So with all these three, it helps you build the perfect honey net that you need to come up with intelligence. And of course, the last bunch of it, and, and thought, not just producing intelligence, but also when, when it comes to, to non-profit uh, organization like us, we always focus a lot on intelligence. So this group, amazingly, we came up with a crazy um, proof of concept um, network. We have taken it down um, because it's really expensive to maintain them. But yeah, so very interesting things that we have done using HoneyNet uh, and during that period of time really understanding threat intelligence and um, building up that, that, that blue team um, skill on, on intelligence in, in this course of research. Right, the other research I really want to talk about is um, game theory. So, like I say, we are kind of like, when it comes to honeypots, we are kind of like playing with the attackers. So if you are playing with them, it's a kind of little game. Um, so it's like, why don't we explore things like game theory? So before, even before we start doing that, again, you have to really understand the concept. So honeypots, they, honeypots is just not, it's not just any resources. You are always playing with four things, right? You are playing with data control, Data capture, data collection, and data analysis. Yeah, all, lots of people always just think that, yeah, it's just capturing of data. And fine, you need to analyze them. But actually, there's a big component behind it, which is the first one, data control. Because you, are think, you have to control what you're putting out there, and that affects many other things as well. Right? You control the data, then it affects, then you can uh, it effectively um, capture and collect data carefully, and only through that, it, it comes out with more meaningful analysis. So the whole idea of this project on game theory is how we can use game theory, play with data control and play and mechanism of data capture, um, and get, you know, and maximize the returns uh, as we engage attackers. So this project was interesting because I just say like, let's, let's look in, into game theory and then Everyone start reading about game theory and just go, there's nothing about IC in game theory. Uh, and they really wrecked their brain out and we decided, right, 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 right. It's too wide a scope. We'll, let's focus on one, uh, interesting strategy. So we picked, um, make, uh, strategy of the Nash equilibrium. Can never get the pronunciation right. Um, so the whole idea is, so the whole idea of this game is each strategy that you take and as well as your opponent takes, there's always a probability of them making certain move. Um, so this 
always kind of like a like a move game. Um, so what we play around is if we keep changing the HoneyNet configuration in a certain way, would, how would they actually react? So how can we really maximize uh, the returns back from there as we change the network? As we change, suddenly we disable certain commands, suddenly we change how the network structure is being looked look like, how do we actually react to that? Um, but like I say, it was it was an interesting one. Uh, it was the uh, the 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 result the research result we got back was an interesting one. Uh, however, because um, Singapore Poly pretty much just gave me X amount of weeks with my students. By the time we finally got to experiment on this, uh, we can only play with one little uh, game with the attacker. Um, yeah. So. My follow-up with that is actually I, came, I went back and said I'm going to propose another project which is more scope. So let's play a game with the attacker, but not just say game theory, which is huge. Um, so I look very specifically on the attack model, the, the MITRE attack model. Um, with, with all those listed hundred and something, something TCP that's out there, uh, can we actually predict where they're moving and how can we decept them and get them to, 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 to really show their strategy more and more to, uh, to us. So, um, the students, uh, my new batch of students went a bit crazy again. So what we did is we merged the cyber queue chain, the seven steps with the attack model. Well, subset of the attack model. We picked about 42 of the 280, uh, tactics out there. If we, I think if we really consider all 280, we'll really go crazy doing this. Um, so what we did is with this, um, uh, it helps. We operationalize it and see, um, as the attacker makes a certain move, what is the likelihood of them going to the next one? And if you decept or if you interject some of their behavior, what is, uh, how we actually affect their behavior in moving around the queue chain or showing some of the, or changing of their tactics and, and so on. So this, um, uh, yeah, this is also another, so this is an interesting one. Um, so in terms of research wise, it's important that you really scope it, that you know what you want, not just saying that, let's test this theory. And within this theory, there's like 100 over different theories. Um, yeah. So another project I want to share is the IoT Honeypot project. Um, this project was, like I said, was meant to be the conceptual project, which is what I wanted them to do is to talk about, or to, to look into how do you design honeypots effectively, right? Which means they need to understand IoT properly, they need to understand threat landscape and so on and so forth. And then through those understanding, uh, then they build the most optimum honeypots, right? Uh, but this bunch of students, um, what they did instead is they jumped right into production without doing the research. Uh, but I don't blame them because they came up with a very interesting proposal. Um, so the lesson learned about this is I have a bunch, I have a, I have a students, I have a group of students who are really good developers. So you have to choose the right, you know, the, the right students or the right, um, researchers for the right kind of project. But they did go back and look at all the different things that I tell them to do beforehand. So they came up with uh, an interesting tool called Btrace. Uh, so what they do, uh, for what this IoT uh, Honeypot does is pretty much is for, it, it can be used to plug into any home. So they have this little Raspberry Pi here that, have a, that has an AI machine using TensorFlow. So it will look at the traffic. And if it's a actual real traffic, it goes into the actual network. If not, they will divert them to a uh, IoT um, HoneyNet. Uh, over there. So that was interesting. Right. So the other uh, project I want to quickly delve into also is actually when it comes to HoneyNet or HoneyPods, lots of people also again have the concept that it is a very passive machine sitting there waiting to be attacked. Um, so there is a kind of HoneyPods called Honey Clients. So instead of just waiting there, you kind of, you it's, it acts as a client to find offensive server or server that is doing exploit, uh, that is actively exploiting uh, clients, like, like drive-by and so on and so forth. 
right? So what this um, project did, what, what was produced out of this project is use, using two Honey clients, uh, Thug and Yali, serving various different purposes. They collect various different data. They go to website and they gather as much data back as possible. Um, and through this, you know, you can use it to enhance or you can use it um, in use cases such as for uh, actively hunting uh, for malicious servers in your network or in your uh, IP, IP space and so on. So if you can, if, if you look at it, most of this project is not really about honeypots. It's really about the underlying domains, the knowledge that is behind it. Like, although, right, I didn't talk about all the projects. So for example, when, um, for, for the first project, you focus a lot on DevSec Ops, really not about the honeypots itself, right? Threat intelligence focus more on the intelligence before you even start to deploy honeypots. Um, they, the other two groups look a lot into the game theory side of things. Then they look into honeypots, right? And again, on, um, on attack queue chains and the attack model, uh, advisory behavior and so on. So even a tool development as well. You want to develop a good IOC honeypots? You need to understand IOC very well, right? You want to you want to build a survey tool, a tool that can really actively be out there, understanding the threat landscape, the the level of exploitation traffic out there. You need to understand those network well. You want to build a sinkhole, you need to understand network again, right? Or you want to do honey clients, you need to understand the client technology, you need to understand those browser. So, honeypots. If 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 you've always been wondering, like, what is the way that you can develop your blue team skill? You can really improve your, um, your, your domain knowledge in the blue team side. Honeypot is a great way of doing so. So all these projects will be, will, will not be, um, possible without all these brilliant students. So if you want to hire technical guys, here, here you are. Um, so right. So, a quick conclusion. Um, so honeypots again is really up to your imagination. Uh, it can be anything and it's a great way that you can use to explore new concept, explore new blue team skills, uh, level up your, your skills in, in the blue team, uh, context. Um, and from there you can, with all this new acquired skill, you can bring it back to your organization and improve the overall security or the overall operations or how you run security in your Company, organization, network, or uh, whatnot. So that's all for me. Um, any questions? Thank you very much, Emil. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, if there are no more questions, please do remember that Emil will be around for the rest of the day. So if you do think of any questions, please feel free to ask him. And now before we go to the coffee break, we have one more talk. But before I get into that, I would like to remind you that everyone here is invited to our post-conference party, uh, which I feel is the best party of the entire year. So you all really have to come. It's at 9 p.m. tonight at the Fullerton Bay Hotel. Uh, the address on the slides is wrong, so please do not look at the slides for guidance on this matter. Please go to AT Collier uh, Key. It's the Fulton Bay Hotel at the Rooftop Bar at 9 p.m. Furthermore, I would like to remind you that uh, we have stickers lying around, so especially for our coffee break and later on our networking break, please take a few stickers that are suitable to your field or your fields of interest, stick them on your shirt or anywhere else that is visible, and go talk to people who seem like they have interesting stickers and interesting things to talk about. We will be right back with the next speakers, uh, so please, uh, Keep sitting down, and we'll be right back in the next uh, minutes. Uh, give it up one more time for Emil. <laughs>